Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. There's a ton going on in the news, and this week we're going to dig underneath the headlines and find out what's important to real estate investors, and it's not all what you think. Another edition of Clues in the News, today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Hey, this is Brad Sunrock, and I'm super excited to share with you about our sixth annual Apartment Investor National Conference, Aim That Con. This is the sixth year we've done this event, and in the past, we've had world-class speakers like Robert Kiyosaki, Grant Cardone, Jesse Itzler, Ed Milet, and this year, it's gonna be so many great speakers. We already have some lined up. It's gonna be an outstanding event, whether you're new to apartments, already syndicating large deals, already have a successful business. If you want to learn how to make more money and pay less taxes with apartment investing, this is the event for you. Join the Apartment King, Brad Sumrock, and our rock star lineup of speakers at the sixth annual Apartment Investor Mastery National Conference, Aim Con 2023. It happens in Dallas, Texas, August 25th through 27th, and you get all the details by sending an email to aimnatcon at realestateguysradio.com. That's aimnatcon at realestateguysradio.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio show. I'm your host, Robert Helms, and joining me, our co-host and financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. There's a lot to talk about, and I know, Russ, you look through the news and the headlines every single day, as do I, and we try to distill that down to the information that matters to real estate investors, and occasionally, we'll do a show like this one we call Clues in the News where we look beneath the headlines and really try to interpret what's being said for real estate investors. There are folks who, you know, buy a house to live in and they have a job and they go to the grocery store and they put gas in their tanks. And a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about today may affect them. But when you're an investor, that's a whole different category. In addition to your household life and expenses and income, you've got property you're putting to work. And so we're always looking at the economic sea that real estate investors float in. Yes, we spent some time looking at the big picture and talking about how macro rolls down to Main Street, but part of the way you figure out what macro matters is by starting on Main Street and working your way up. When things manifest on Main Street, whether it's housing prices or foreclosures or people filing bankruptcy or businesses growing and wages growing, there's, there can be signs that things are going well, signs that things are going poorly. And then you try to figure out what those drivers are. When we look at a market, we talk about those economic drivers. A market's got to have multiple drivers. It's got to have migration patterns multiple business or primary drivers that provides the local economy because real estate is so uh, local, infrastructure and regulation. So there's a lot of things that you look at when you're underwriting a specific market. And it's the same thing kind of when you look at a product niche like housing versus say multifamily and you could put residential in one category and then there's office. I think it's been in the news a lot recently that commercial space is in trouble, has been in trouble. Major, major malls shutting down retail has been undergoing the Amazon effect for some time and then and then got hit with the pandemic and people work from home and office got hit. Now, because of rising interest rates, some of these companies can't roll over their shorter term uh, commercial loans, residential loans tend to be a little bit more stable. So there's so many things we could talk about. Right now, we're going to focus on what's going on in housing because I think that a lot of people can relate to that. And they say when they look at an economy, housing, you can look at it a couple of different ways. Either it is a driver, meaning when people buy homes and they get all the ancillary services to setting the home up or they move up, it creates a lot of economic activity. Some people look at it like it's a uh, trailing indicator. In other words, the economy is doing well because people are able to buy houses. Uh, you know, you can make the argument either way. I think for right now, we just want to look at what's going on in housing and try to understand how the way things have been changing with interest rates and lending criteria and supply and demand and migration patterns and people coming out of COVID and life getting back to normal again. 
what is really going on in housing and what can we glean from that? So let's jump into some of the articles. Last week, NTT Business News reached out to us to get our take on the fact that the U.S. home prices had declined for the first time in 11 years, which got our attention. And that came out of uh, the Case-Shiller Index. So just a little bit of background, uh, Carl Case and Robert Schiller, years and years ago, put together this very useful calculation typically would come out monthly, a couple of the indices quarterly, to give us an idea of the direction of housing prices. So primarily pricing, not the number of sales. And today, uh, it is the Standard and Poor's CoreLogic Case-Shiller Home Price Indices, and there's basically four of them, a National Home Price Index, which is the one we'll talk about. Then they also do a very useful 20-city composite index and a 10-city composite composite index. Uh, And then they have individual indices for some of those metros. So if you think about it, all real estate is local, as you mentioned, Russ, and trying to get your mind around a national number is hard. When we say nationally, the real estate market has done X, Y, or Z, really nationally it hasn't. It's a composite of what's happening all around. So that's what the Case-Shiller Index is. And when NTD Business News reached out, they said, what What do you guys make of this? And, and here's what's happened. For the first time since 2012, the year-over-year home price across the board declined, and it declined by 0.2%. So the amount isn't that much, but the point uh, was confusing to people because if you had put Case-Shiller Index into any search, you would have got a series of articles that say the pricing is down. And you would have got a series of articles that say the pricing is up. And first of all, this was for the month of April. So they reached out to us at the end of June because it takes seven or eight weeks to calculate all this data. So we typically see a lagging period. And in April, the home price was actually up by about 1.5% compared to March but it was down 0.2% compared to the previous April. So that's what set kind of the news cycle on fire with this. And uh, the questions they asked us uh, on the news had to do with what did that mean for the market? Is that a downturn? Is that because there's less sales? And is it related to interest rate? And I think those are the things that we want to talk through. Yeah, well, I I think it's interesting. We look for these different inputs. You have to say, well, what really affects the price of homes in general? And some of those are local conditions. Many of them are. And some of them are national conditions. Obviously, the article is attributing the slowdown to rising the rapid rise of mortgage rates. Okay, that's valid, right? Because that everybody's affected by that in every market everywhere. So that is you know, something that's universal. Taxes could be part of that. Well, and it's not just the fact that uh, we've pointed this out on the show that the rates have risen. It's the fact that they've risen more quickly than they have in 60 years. Yeah, it's quite shocking. And and you have uh, some other factors. You have demographic factors. You've got this big cohort of people coming into their home buying years called the millennials, and they've been delayed in entering the market because they've also been burdened with huge amounts of student debt. And going through the COVID crisis, some of the temporary uh, things that were put in place to stimulate the economy was forgiveness or at least deferment on those student loan payments. That's getting ready to come back in. And so it's really hard to look at any single factor and go, oh, that's the driver. And I think that's the lesson here. You know, if you're reading the news and you see something that is turned into a news article and they offer a very simplistic explanation for uh, what is happening in a very complex market, it's easy then to draw a conclusion and and make a mistake. You don't want to make it overcomplicated, but you do have to understand, obviously, capacity to pay is important. And the most important part of capacity to pay, assuming someone has a job, is going to be the price of the credit. And in any environment where you start raising the interest rates, you, by definition, are going to start putting downward pressure on the pricing unless the income stream to support it can absorb that. And obviously it hasn't, at least it hasn't until recently. You, you have to look, when you look at capacity to pay, you're gonna look at the cost of the credit, the availability of the credit, 
and what real wages are. And then you have to put that against the supply and demand of real estate in the specific geographic market. And then you have to look at some other factors. And one of the factors is when you have mortgage rates rising, people who have existing homes who would normally sell that home and buy a new home and get a new mortgage, they don't want to do it because they don't want to replace that 3% mortgage with a 6% mortgage. So they stand pat and that creates inventory issues that a lot of people at the National Association of Realtors have been crying about for a long time. Well, and I think there's another nuance to that. You're exactly right. People who have a three or three and a half percent loan who might have otherwise wanted to sell their house think, well, I'm not going to sell now. Uh, the house I'm going to buy, whether it's a lateral move to a nearby market or a move up because I need more bedrooms or more space, I'm going to pay double in the interest rates today. So that's just crazy. So there's reasons that people aren't putting their homes up for sale who might have. And so then the premise would be, well, that means there's fewer houses on the market, which is true. And it means that some people have to buy. So they're buying and that's going to send the prices up. Except what's happened is the people who are having to buy are buying less house because of the affordability. So rather than buy that 2,200 square foot four bathroom home, they're buying a 1,700 square foot three bedroom condominium. So that actually means that the prices are coming down. Now, the other point is it's always compared to what? And if you look at the year over year since April, as you can probably figure out, we had pretty good price appreciation in April of 2022. In fact, it was almost the peak. And so when you look at it a year later, it's down a little bit. And uh, this particular article, and there were several articles from several different big sources about uh, this article and their interpretation. But if you look at these articles, they basically say, well, we'll see what happens in the coming months. Are we going to see next month it be year over year down 0.5 and then 0.8 and then 1%? Or is it going to bounce back next? month. Most of what we look at with these indices are kind of a three-month rolling average. And so when you're like the, the individual market indices, you look at the, what Phoenix or Dallas or Miami's doing, it gives us pretty good data. But when we step back and look at median home price across the United States, well, the, the idea is that's going to kind of equate everything. But looking at the chart, and I'll just hold it up really close here to the microphone so you guys can see it. Uh, I'm looking at the 20 city index. And as you can imagine, the median, the U.S. in the middle is about halfway through the markets that are actually up in value and the metros that are down in value or where acceleration has slowed. That's another thing we've learned from all of our economist friends. Disinflation is not the same as deflation, meaning disinflation says inflation isn't going up as highly as it was. Peter Schiff shared that on the summit this year. It's still going up. It's just not going up as badly. So people say, oh, it's only 4%. That's pretty good. Well, it's pretty good compared to the 9% it was, but it's not pretty good compared to the 2% we're used to. So for instance, in the 20 market index, uh, the top, if you will, performing market is Miami, Florida, Why the lowest performing market is Seattle, Washington, and everything else falls in between. But this average that they're looking at says that the median home price has gone down a little bit. Now, one more thing on this, and that is, it is independent of sales volume. Not that the price isn't affected by sales volume. It is if there's more buyers chasing less inventory that drives prices up and vice versa. But the Case-Shiller Index is only about the price paid. It's not about the volume of sales. And let's jump in and just talk a little bit about maybe why this matters to somebody. If you're a real estate investor out there in your local market and you're busy looking for deals and you find something that makes sense to you, that's fantastic. We always talk about when you get a rental property in particular, you're not just concerned about the tenant who's there or maybe the tenant after them, but you want to make sure that there's a line, there's consistent demand. So you pay attention to the market you're in. Is it growing or is it shrinking? And part of that is by compared to other markets, because when people are struggling in an expensive market and they start thinking about where could we move, where could we go to have a better quality of life for the same income, this is where you need to know where your local market compares to other markets. So even if you're only invested in a particular market, you say, I'm really not interested in what's going on in other parts of the world. 
the people in your market may be looking at other parts of the world. And if the general economic uh, environment in your local market and in the macro market are putting downward pressure on affordability, then there's a percentage of people in your market that are going to be looking for a more affordable place to go. If you happen to be in one of the most affordable markets, and you might be the recipient of people moving into your market, driving that market up. If, for example, as real estate in California become just really ridiculously overpriced, and some of these articles are referring to that, adjacent states that had more affordable markets, meaning Nevada and Phoenix in particular, Boise was the recipient of immigrants, not just from California, but also from Washington state. And that was probably a direct reflection of how it had became difficult to maintain a standard of living in some of these coastal states and people were willing to move inward to do that. So you do need to know where you fit in. That's why we look at these things. We're trying to understand what is this saying about the economy as a whole? Where do we think it's going to drive migration in and out? Where are going to be the opportunities? Where are going to be the places we need to get out of? Back after 2008, we looked around and we said, hey, we think that Dallas, Texas has got the right kind of economy to survive what's going on. It's going to be a winner. 2010, we're leading field trips out there. It was generally prior to 2008, one of the most boring equity markets ever. It was a cash flow market. And I remember Robert going out there, seeing it for the very first time and really looking at it on one of our market field trips. And I said to myself, this reminds me of Southern California in the late 70s when I was in Southern California, which was a cash flow market. And it turned into a equity market uh, because people all moved out of the crowded Los Angeles basin out into the east where I was. And I could see that move happen. And I said to myself, I think Dallas is going to flip from a cash flow market to an equity market. And sure enough, over the last 10 years, that's what happened. And it became harder and harder to buy income producing properties in Dallas. But people who did ended up making a lot of equity. Well, things are starting to shift again. And that's what we're, we're beginning to pay attention to. Well, it brings up such a great point, which is we don't invest in the national home market. Now, if you buy home builder stocks or you look at some of the REITs, maybe you play that way. But as real estate investors, we can be a lot more nimble. We can look at, say, the 20 markets and then discern where is the puck going? Which markets have the best opportunity for increasing rents and therefore increasing values? It's Clues in the News. We're looking at headlines and what it means to real estate investors. We got lots more coming up. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. For thousands of years of human history, silver has been recognized as money. But then in 1965, the United States took silver out of the financial system. But did silver stop being money? Smart investors don't think so. And ever since, when there are concerns about the quality of the currency, alert investors seek shelter in silver and gold. As the size and frequency of major financial crises grow, silver is attracting a lot of attention. To help better understand the what, why, and how of silver, watch the free nine-part series, Making Sense of Silver, everything you always wanted to know about silver but didn't know to ask, featuring 30-year precious metals veteran Dana Samuelson. Send your email request to silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. Whether you own silver now or you're wondering if it's too late, email silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. 
Hello, this is Robert Kiyosaki. I'm the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And if you're serious about learning how to invest in real estate, listen to the real estate guys. They really know what they're talking about. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Heard every weekend on this fabulous radio station all the time at realestateguysradio.com and your favorite podcast outlets. You can always go back and listen to the podcast version again if you choose to. It's clues in the news. We're looking at headlines and we started with kind of the big headline, which is the Case Shiller Index going down for the first time in uh, almost a dozen years. But I wanted to just piggyback on that by looking at this 20 city index to give folks an idea. This isn't to tell you what market to invest in, but just understanding that if we look at this year over year gain, I mentioned that Miami had the highest year over year gain and kind of in descent order from there, Tampa, Florida, Charlotte, Atlanta, Chicago, New York, Cleveland, Detroit. Those were the markets that were going up, less or so. I mentioned that the market that had come down in price the most was Seattle. Slightly behind that, San Francisco, San Diego, Las Vegas, Portland. Also right kind of in the middle, Phoenix, Denver, Los Angeles, and Dallas. So those are markets that are starting to go down or have year over year. Not enough information with just one month's data to say, oh, these markets are over, but it is a point on the curve. In fact, another article that we came across June 27th in the Dallas Morning News says Dallas Fort Worth home prices continue historic decline as U.S. followed suit. So this also is going to mention the Case Shiller Index, but it basically is saying Dallas Fort Worth has continued to decline according to one of the most respected measures of the housing market, and that is the Case Shiller Index we've been talking about. So we just looked at the 20 cities. It didn't cover them all, but the big chunk of them. Then in each one of these metros in the news, there was an article we saw in Chicago, one in Florida, one in Arizona and this one in Dallas says that the housing market is slowing down. Now, slowing down to them means that prices are adjusting. And I don't think there's a lot of new information in this article. They talk about the same things we've been talking about, sticker shock and mortgage rates, the fact that we have constrained supply and that fewer people are moving. But it also said that from March to April, U.S. prices were up 1.3 percent and Local prices in Dallas were up 1.4. So a month ago, Dallas was beating the national average. And this month, year over year, Dallas is down a little bit. Yeah, and they said that this was the first uh, year over year decline since April of 2012. And so I, I think what's going on to a lot of pundits who are watching uh, they're all looking for leading indicators. What is around the corner? We've had historic interest rate increases. We've had uh, energy issues. We've had a severe disruption to supply chains that we're still recovering from. We've got the rise of China. We've got the growing government debt and debt service, which is sucking money out of the private sector. So there's a lot of pressure that economists look at trying to figure out the health of the economy. And of course, Anybody that was around, you know, 20 years ago that went through the 2008 crisis 15 years ago is traumatized by anything that looks like weakness in real estate. And of course, now the other thing is you've got banks that have been suffering because their bond portfolios have been struggling as a result of the increase in interest rates. We covered that when we discussed what happened out with Silicon Valley Bank and other banks that have struggled. But now you've got people who are holding mortgages. And you begin to see equity going down and that disincentivizes some people to keep making those payments if they lose their equity. So we haven't gone to a place where we have anything that even looks like a housing bust. But if you look at the chart, you could definitely say that there's been a housing bubble since the last bubble reflated. And it's probably healthy if a little bit of that excess air comes out. The question is, can the wizards who pull the levers, who are uh, trying to let some of that air out, uh, are they going to let it out slowly? Do we get a soft landing or is it going to bust? And so we don't know. We're sitting here just like all of you trying to figure it out. We're looking at what these experts are saying. We're a little bit maybe closer to the street. We have lots of people we talk with that are active in a lot of different markets. We spend a lot of our time looking at all this stuff. But it is interesting that one of the most dynamic, strong, resilient markets ever has just experienced a slight year-over-year -year decline for the first time in, in 11 years. Now, the article goes on to say that after a historic 57% rise in prices from April of 2020 to June 2022, so just a over two years, DFW prices sank 8.5% through January 2023, 
but bounced back 2.5% through April. So whether or not it's declined kind of depends on what your starting point was and what your ending point is, and then you manipulate the data in such a way that prices are up or down. But I think their point is it's still a very competitive market. It's still net in migration, still high in job growth. To me, if a market like that has gone down in price a little, it might be that property's on sale. But again, you've got to finance that with loans that are up. And the point you always make, Russ, is if you find a property that works at today's interest rates as a rental property and interest rates go down in the future, it's easy enough in one to four residential to refinance that. And if prices happen to go up in the interest rate market, well, you'll be glad that you got a loan at today's prices. So it does affect not just homeowners, though. It affects renters and therefore landlords. And that's why we're talking about it. In fact, one of our favorite uh, housing consultants, John Burns, they put on an article June 14th that said, home ownership is now $1,000 more per month expensive than renting. So a year ago, it was a couple hundred dollars more uh, to own a property. And for all the reasons, tax benefits and, and you know building up equity and all those reasons, it probably made sense. Well, today, folks that might be looking at owning a home at $1,000 a month difference, all of a sudden, renting looks a little more interesting. Yeah, it's really challenging because as more people make that decision and enter the renter pool, then that creates more demand over available units and rents go up too. And so they say in economics, the key to high prices is high prices and the key to low prices is low prices. In other words, when prices get low enough, people quit supplying the market. And when prices get high enough, new inventory comes on. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, going back to this Dallas article, is that in a market where the prices have declined a little bit, one of the big problems is inventory. So you get a lot of upward pressure on pricing from the supply-demand dynamic, but downward pressure from the affordability. If somebody figures out how to go into the market and add to the supply, you, you could maybe see even more downward pressure. So I guess a lesson in that is in all markets, understand not just, again, the affordability based on wages and interest rates, but really understand the inventory and the availability of inventory, whether it's a buyer or seller's market. Uh, you can tell that by number of listings, number of sales, days on market. And of course, anecdotally, just looking around and seeing if there are a lot of for sale signs or are there none. And just understand what is the market's capacity to be able to add excess inventory or extra inventory. So you have to pay attention to building permits, home builder sentiment in the market. Uh, these are other indicators you try and understand. Is there even land available to develop? Sometimes a place has a lot of land until it's all built and then it doesn't. I remember Silicon Valley back in the day, orchards everywhere, people building homes everywhere. And then one day, you know, I went from being a little boy to a grown man. I looked around and go, gosh, this place is crowded, right? There's no more places to build new houses. Then all the existing houses become very expensive and it continues to be that way in places like New York or the San Francisco Bay Area, just because there's just not enough capacity to expand. So these are the factors you got to look at. Again, there's a lot of things. The information is available. The clues are in the news. You got to do a deeper dive. The answers aren't going to be in the news, but the clues that can cause you to dive a little bit deeper and look at the market. And I do think that in a market where you have high interest rates and a semi-fragile economy and credit market, you do need to do even a better job of underwriting your markets and understanding the dynamics of your market. Because really, when you buy a property in a market, you're getting married to that market. You're going to probably do a 30-year loan. You're probably going to have to be in for five or 10 years, unless you have a real forced equity play where you can do some type of rehab. You're going to be in that market for a while. So you got to understand the market and have great management, even before you understand the deal itself. It's clues in the news, what's happening in the headlines, and what that means to us as real estate investors. More when we come back, and we'll play real estate trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Having trouble finding deals where the numbers make sense? Invest in an asset class that delivers cash flow to you in good times and bad, and where most of that cash flow is tax-free. I'm Dave Zook. Many of you have heard me speak at Real Estate Guys events or heard me on their podcast. 
My team is a top five ATM operator in the country, and right now accredited investors can make cash flow returns well into the double digits and get huge tax deductions. For your free report on this lucrative asset class, email ATM at realestateguysradio.com. As I speak, inflation is robbing you at a rate north of 10%. Last year, the number one zip code that Mid-South Homebuyers offered income property to Real Estate Guys listeners in appreciated by 21%. To harness that spread and protect and grow your wealth in the current economic storm, you need the two decades of experience in renovation and management that Mid-South Homebuyers brings to their investors. Every home Mid-South offers you will have brand new components, a new 30-year roof, and a high-quality renter, all in a price range under $150,000. Their empathetic property managers will use your ROI as their North Star, while the lack of repairs on their totally renovated properties contributes to their almost four-year average renter's stay and 99% occupancy rate. Learn about their lifetime occupancy guarantee and total one-year maintenance guarantee by emailing midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. That's midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. You'll be glad you did. Hi, this is Steve Forbes. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Have fun. You'll learn something. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio show. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Hey, make plans to join us in fabulous New Orleans, Louisiana for the 49th annual New Orleans Investment Conference. It takes place the first week of November. You can get all the details by sending an email to New Orleans at realestateguysradio.com. It's another edition of Clues in the News today. We're digging beneath the headlines to find out what real estate investors need to know. Before we get back to that, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia. Your chance to win a prize by knowing today's Real Estate Trivia question. Just a minute, I'll give you the question. As soon as you have the answer, send your guests to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name and physical mailing address because the first person that gets it right it's an awesome book called Bringing Value, Solving Problems, and Leaving a Legacy. Put together by our good friend Kyle Wilson. That could be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last week, we were talking about getting started or starting over with affordable cash flow properties. And we asked this, where is the world's largest gas station? Well, it's in Seaverville, Tennessee. It opened on June 26th this year, and it's the newest Bucky's. A phenomenon unto itself. This one has 120 gas pumps, 350 employees, and more than 74,000 square feet. Definitely a great place for a pit stop. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. Of the top 20 most air polluted cities on earth in 2022, 14 were in one country. Which one? Which country has most of the polluted cities? According to last year's list by the World Health Organization, if you know or just want to guess, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Be sure to give us the answer, your name, and your physical mailing address. Send it to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. First person that gets it right gets this awesome book, Bringing Value, Solving Problems, and Leaving a Legacy. That's today's real estate trivia question. It's clues in the news. We're taking a look at the headlines that matter to real estate investors. Uh, this article came out on Yahoo Finance in the middle of May, but I thought it was interesting because it's a little different than what we've been talking about. Home Depot's lackluster Q1 shows that the remodeling boom is over. This article says that interest in big home improvement projects is waning. That's one of the takeaways from Home Depot's uninspired first quarter results. People are spending less at Home Depot. They're holding off on projects, perhaps, and it could be that they're being deferred, or maybe people are breaking their big home improvement uh, projects into smaller chunks. But on a yearly basis, customer transactions slid almost 5%, according to Home Depot. Now, obviously, that's just one publicly traded company. It's a big one, and certainly that's going to uh, give us uh, some clues into this part of the industry. But when you see interest rates high, then as we've talked about, one of the decisions some homeowners make is not to sell, and therefore maybe they improve instead. 
But if that were the case, we'd see the opposite. We'd see that uh, the big box home improvement uh, dealers would be increasing. So this is interesting to look at. I think it really ties into interest rates. If you're looking, usually these home improvement projects are the results of home equity lines of credit, cash out refinances. You're not going to do a cash out refinance and replace a 3% loan with a 5 or 6% loan. You may decide it's not a good time to put money into a property because you may not see the ROI on that because the prices are coming down. So that's another concern. Another little snippet out of this article that I thought was interesting, it says do-it-yourself customers also outperformed the professional sector as demand shifted towards smaller projects. To me, if you've got limited budget and you're trying to fix your home up, you do it yourself. And you do the smaller projects and you defer on the bigger projects when you would need a professional because you're not ready to do that. So it, it does speak to softness in the consumer sector. And I think that that is a bigger factor. So it's not just the unwillingness of people maybe to tap into equity at higher interest rates or a slowdown or decline in appreciation. Uh, It could just be general softness because of the inflation that everybody's experienced in energy and healthcare and food and people are, are are feeling the squeeze. I think that's a big part of it. You walk down the aisle of any store, Home Depot included, and prices are up. Whether it's a landscaping project or an addition or anything in between, it's like, well, it's going to cost me more now. And then to your point, Russ, if you finance it, it's definitely going to cost you more. I think there's one more point, and that is when do people do remodeling and improvement projects? Many times because the house is going on the market. We have this, you know, eyesore bathroom that we've been meaning to do for six or seven years. The realtor says, hey, if you spend $3,000 in the bathroom, it'll probably translate to $6,000 more in asking price. Why don't you do that? The home will look clean and fresh. And so if, to our earlier point, fewer people are putting their homes on the market, then fewer people are doing those kinds of improvements. Yep. Now, Russ, you also mentioned the fact that we see inflation and people's wages are affected by that. An article came out uh, June 13th, Business Insider, that said pay raises just caught up with inflation for the first time in two years. This is a fascinating idea. I remember a dozen years ago, we started talking about the ebb and flow and how when inflation worked its way through the economy, it didn't start with wages. Wages were one of the lagging indicators and they caught up slowly. And so according to this article, pay raises have caught up with inflation. Yeah, in March of 2023, uh, according to this graph that I found on Statista, the real wages, um, which is the net between the wage growth and the inflation. So in other words, let's say you get a 10% raise and you have 5% inflation, then your wage growth would be an increase of 5% net. Of course, the reverse is true. If you get a 5% increase and you have 10% inflation, then your wage growth net declined by 5%. And that had been going on since March of 2021. And so for the last, from March of 2021, all the way to March of 2023, people were experiencing a decline in real wage growth because of inflation. And so that makes everything less affordable. And so when that gets burned into your psychology, you begin to pull back. People begin to adjust. And the reverse may be true if, in fact, this trend continues, and it continued as far as I can see from March to May and into June, uh, where people are beginning to experience real wage growth. If that trend continues, then I think over time, people will begin to become more confident, more bullish. Now, they may be having to pay off credit that they incurred uh, during the rest of the time. I don't know. You know, these are things we're going to have to watch. But it is a good sign. Well, I think the point you made, which is this crossed over, you will, the line between wages and inflation back in March of 2021. And if we look at it, you know, every month inflation was higher than wage growth for two years. And that means that's cumulative. So every month that inflation was up, but my wages weren't up as much, I either had to 
live below my means even more. I had to spend less discretionary income. I had to stop going to Home Depot for home improvement projects. I had to eat chicken instead of steak, or I put some of those things on my credit card. And now we've just seen it turn the other way, which it has been before. But there's another nuance to this chart, and obviously you can't see it on the podcast or the radio show. But if you look at the chart, you can see that wage growth is fairly consistent. What has come down is the rate of inflation. So it's not that wage growth is crazy high. It's that inflation came down from 8.6 to 8.5 to 7.7 is now down closer to four. So we haven't seen runaway wage inflation. What we've seen is the combination of good wage growth and prices coming down. Again, if I look at this chart back in January of 2020 through, you know, November of 2020, inflation was 0.6%, 1.3%, 1.5%. Now inflation is 5%, 4%, 6%. So it's a lot more. It's just not as bad as it was for the last two years. Yeah, I, I think there's no doubt that inflation is a problem for Main Street, our tenants, People who are trying to buy homes, everybody out there working for a living. I mean, it continues to be an issue. It's going to be interesting. The Fed paused. I think probably everybody caught that. They would had this very aggressive rate hiking program they were on. They just recently paused. Historically, a pause typically means a pivot, meaning that they'll pause raising rates and then talk hawkishly like they're going to raise them again. But historically, they, they haven't done that. Uh, we'll see. You know, every time... It, it could be different, but I, I do think that right now there are some signs that this downward pressure on the economy is going to abate for a little while. Um, I did a presentation on the summit uh, this last summer, and one of the things that I pointed out was taking a look at the spread between inflation and interest rates in the 70s and what it took in the 80s to cure it. And the first time they raised interest rates up to a point, thought they had it, backed off, wasn't enough, and it came roaring back. And then finally, they had to really get aggressive. So I do think that we have to be prepared for that. I'm not 100% convinced that our financial system and our economy could withstand the kind of rate hikes that we experienced back in the 70s or in the early 80s, but but maybe because it's really about percentages. You know, if you, uh, one of the things I pointed out is that when if you have a federal funds rate at 0 0.25, 25 basis points, and that rate goes up to two and a half percent, that's a 10x increase. Whereas back in the 80s, we had an interest rate around 8% at the beginning of the hiking, and it went up to 18. It sounds really bad, 18 really bad, but in terms of change, it was a little over double, went from 8 to 18 versus going from 0.25 to 2.5 is a 10x increase. And so it may be that what they did was enough. We don't know. We're going to find out. But I do think that there may be a window of opportunity if rates do soften a little bit and lending is still available. It might be an opportunity where prices are a little soft, well, rates are a little soft to make a move on a property if you can find the right property in the right market with the right dynamics and cash flow and management. Um, and of course, if interest rates drop to your point earlier, Robert, you can always refinance. And if interest rates go back up again, you're going to be really, really happy you locked in that low rate. But hopefully this trend of real wage growth happening will continue. Uh, and hopefully an even better trend that inflation will go down, which would be good for Main Street. And then that way we can drive our own inflation by increasing rents rather than just waiting on on inflation, which is really, really difficult on our tenants. Now, not to go too far down the rabbit hole on this topic, but you will want to pay attention next week as we bring you a live show from the 21st Annual Investor Summit. You'll hear directly from George Gammon, but George shared with us a really interesting concept, which is the price of money, interest rates, is not the same as the availability of lending. So we'll leave it at that for now, but you're going to want to have open ears next week as we talk about that. It's Clues in the News. We've got at least one more article to share with you before we're done today. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. Real Estate Guys listeners, are you tired of losing real estate deals due to financing issues? 
Have you had enough of waiting on banks, lenders, and investor groups to fund new projects? What if there were a way to eliminate all the hassle and invest in real estate on your own terms? I'm here to tell you there is. Patrick Donahoe here from Paradigm Life. I'm an Investopedia top 100 most influential financial advisor, and I recently wrote a best selling book about the financial strategy that changed my entire investment model and the one that could change yours. To get a copy of my book for free and learn how you can maximize your real estate portfolio by acting as your own bank, send an email to mybank at realestateguysradio.com. Don't make another real estate deal without reading my book first. Email mybank at realestateguysradio.com now to get your copy for free. The Real Estate Guys are throwing a party and you're invited. Join us at the New Orleans Investment Conference, November 1st through 4th. Now in its 49th year, it's the world's longest running investment conference and features some of the biggest names in economics and investing, including James Rickards, George Gammon, Danielle DiMartino Booth, Rick Rule, and Peter Schiff. The Real Estate Guys are speaking in multiple sessions, attending lots of others, and we're hosting an invitation-only party one of the evenings for our friends and listeners, including some VIPs for you to mingle with. So make your plans to join the Real Estate Guys at the New Orleans Investment Conference. With all that's going on in the world, no serious investor can afford to miss it. Send an email to New Orleans at realestateguysradio.com and we'll get you all the details. That's New Orleans at realestateguysradio.com and we'll see you there. Hi, I'm G. Edward Griffin, author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, a second look at the Federal Reserve. And you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. If you've ever wanted to do bigger deals using other people's money, or if you want to invest passively with folks that are doing awesome stuff, you need to come on out to The Secrets of Successful Syndication. It's our two-day workshop on putting together capital to do bigger deals. Happens October 6th and 7th in Dallas, Texas. All the details on the website at realestateguysradio.com, where it says events. You'll also learn about things like the New Orleans Investment Conference, where we'll be headed later this year. It's clues in the news. We're looking at headlines and what they mean to real estate investors. Uh, interesting uh, tweet from Nick Gurley, who uh, runs Reventure Consulting. He says the Airbnb collapse is real. Revenues are down nearly 50% in cities like Phoenix and Austin. And he's predicting a wave of forced selling from Airbnb owners later this year in places that are hit by this revenue collapse. Now, we mentioned on the summit that a friend of ours who has been at the corporate level for Airbnb for a while uh, has indicated to us that there are definitely markets where the numbers aren't working very well. But I think we can't cast uh, such a wide net that we say, you know, all short-term rentals are bad. In fact, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have an awesome panel of folks who are in the short-term rental business who are absolutely crushing it. But one of the things you'll learn on the panel is not everywhere is the same. Just like we talked about in terms of median home price, there's no one marketplace. As I look at Nick's list, he has the decrease in revenue of more than 40% in Asheville, North Carolina, San Antonio, Texas, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and also Austin and Phoenix, as he mentioned, and then a decrease of more than 30% in a whole bunch of other markets. So it's certainly a concern, but do keep in mind that for the most part, short-term rentals are owned by people who have a second home and want to liquidate some of the cost of ownership. So they aren't necessarily buying a short-term rental to make a bunch of money. People that listen to this show would be more predisposed to buying a short-term rental in a market where you could make a really good return. And there are still markets left like that. But I think this points out the fact that there is no end-all, be-all class of real estate to be invested in. Well, and I think the other thing is it, it lets you know anytime any asset class market gets hot, a bunch of people pile in hoping to ride a wave. Some people are committed to the business. Some people take it seriously, invest in themselves, get proper training, pay attention to the details, really work to do a good job, care about their customers. I think those people will survive. I think what gets flushed out when 
too many players get into any space if, in fact, this is the problem, because if it's a supply and demand, either the demand is drying up in all these markets or there's an oversupply and everybody's getting in the game. I'd have to dig into any given market to see what that issue is. But there's always going to be uh, the people who can compete at the higher level. And so the idea is if you show up every day and you work hard and are honest, you're going to beat you know, half the people or more to break your way up into the, the upper echelon, you're going to have to be excellent in all the things that matter the most. And so I do think that there's going to be those opportunities. Obviously, anecdotally, when we sat down with these people on the panel, uh, these folks are all taking it very seriously. They're people who invest in themselves and uh, are running it like a business, like mature professional disciplined business people, and they're having great success. And and a lot of the people that I talk to in the Airbnb space are that way. Uh, but again, there's a lot of people who think, hey, I'm just going to buy a house and throw it up on Airbnb and make a few bucks. And they don't really cater to the hospitality side of it and treat the customers like uh, they would like if they were in the hotel business. Uh, then all of a sudden, those people don't have a great experience. And you know, once you get a bad reputation, it's really hard in hospitality to make it up. There's no place to hide, right? The rating systems are out there for a reason. So it'll be interesting. And then, of course, Airbnb, if, if these happen to be single-family homes, uh, there's other exit strategies too. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to put houses on the market. They may just may stop holding them out for Airbnb and find some other use for them. So it'll be interesting to watch. I'm looking forward to paying more attention to this space, but it's a bold prediction and the stats are alarming if you look at them in a vacuum. So we're going to continue to watch this trend as well because short-term rental has been one of the hot sectors. You know, when you're looking at the collapse in cap rates and just traditional residential housing, whether it's uh, individual housing or multifamily, then you got to do some specialty use like short-term rental or residential assisted living or student housing, or you got to find some some area, shared housing, where you can command a premium by catering to a very specific need and niche. Short-term rentals clearly falls into that category. So uh, we're going to be watching it and uh, continue to see, and we'll bring some experts on to talk about what their experience is in the real world. We have just wrapped up and are still recovering from the 21st annual Investor Summit on SAN. Next week on the program, you'll hear from many of the faculty members that shared with us during that incredible week plus. And then the week after that, a second show from the summit focused on the short-term rental space Speaking of space, we haven't yet opened up the 2024 Investor Summit, but we're about to. So if you want to get on the advanced notice list and be among the first in the general public to hear about next year's fabulous Investor Summit, just go to realestateguysradio.com, click on the button that says Summit, and sign up for the advanced notice list. It's going to be an absolutely fabulous event. Already some incredible confirmed faculty members with a lot more coming you will find out first if you get on the advance notice list. And you'll get a snippet of what the summit is like next week on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Until then, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys radio show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers, low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.